My name is Raz Al Ghul, a man greatly feared by the criminal underworld. It was 700 years ago. But is Raz Al Ghul immortal? Are his methods supernatural? What if Indiana Jones and Ra's al Ghul collided in a cinematic adventure for the ages? This is Fanscription. We're doing something different today, folks. Since we're five years in, happy anniversary by the way, I wanted to try and challenge myself with a bit of a new concept. Can I craft a good story by matching up two characters from two separate franchises? As always, you'll be the judge. We've never officially seen Indiana Jones vs. Ra's al Ghul, and I remember thinking how great of a matchup that could be way back in the day when watching Batman the Animated Series. There will be influences easy to point out here like The Demon's Quest, Showdown, and Avatar from BTAS, Out of the Past from Batman Beyond, and various Indiana Jones sources from the movies and other mediums. I think combining some of these ideas can create something intriguing. So let's dig up this lost crusade of everyone's favorite archaeologist in a movie we would call Indiana Jones and the Curse of the Lazarus Pit. We start with a classic prologue of Indy on an expedition in Egypt. He's surrounded by a small team made up of a few unnamed local allies, Sala, and a teenaged short round. The silhouette of our hero is seen against the setting sun, as he's preparing to be lowered into a large opening in the ground. More eager to help than ever, Shorty tries to convince Jones to let him come with. Indy raises his head, taking off his iconic hat. We see his bearded face for the first time, as he smiles and says, I got a feeling there won't be much sun down there. Hold on to this, will you? Placing the fedora on his young friend's head, Jones winks. He gives the signal to Sala and is lowered into the ground with a rope tied around his waist. Once he reaches the bottom, a dim lantern reveals ancient Egyptian statues. The ibis-faced god Thoth is featured prominently next to a depiction of Kepri, the deity of the morning sun and renewal of life, among other things. On the wall is a sequence of paintings. They feature Thoth and Kepri syncretizing into one god, sharing features of both the scarab and ibis. The final painting shows the combined deity taking the form of a queen, indicating eternal rule. A large stone doorway sits at the end of the room, surrounded by a smoking moat. Indy gets a whiff and hurriedly straps on a gas mask from his pouch. He wades through the liquid and steps out in front of the doorway. Carved into the door are intricate hieroglyphics with three spaces left unfilled. The empty spaces are shaped like a scarab and ibis, united by a missing onk. Indy runs his hand along the outline of the symbols and takes a golden onk out of his bag. The piece fits perfectly unlocking a mechanism that shifts the god statues, revealing secret compartments inside. Fascinated, Jones walks over to see reflective gold objects in each statue. He excitedly begins to remove them when the rope tied to his waist tugs him back. Indy looks up, comically insulted, before walking back toward the keys. Just as he touches one, he's whipped upward by the rope. His lantern flings forward, landing near the moat surrounding the tomb door. Up top, a firefight is broken out. Led by Short Round, Indy's allies are exchanging gunfire with figures clad in black. Jones, Sala, and Shorty take cover behind a boulder. Out of a jeep steps a man in a black suit, sporting thick mutton chops. Jones recognizes him and frowns. Arcady Duval. I hate this guy. Agitated, he snatches his hat off Short Round's head. Sala explains to Shorty that Duval is second in command to his father's rogue band of assassins called the League of Shadows. The teenager asks who his father is. Before anyone can answer, an explosion erupts out of the opening in the ground. Stunned from the blast, the trio peek their heads around to see all their cohorts knocked down with the League in control. Through the distorted heat steps a man flanked by Duval and a handful of soldiers. He's dressed in a dark suit shoulders covered by a dark green collared cape. Anyone else would look overly theatrical in the garb, but this man's icy stare and sharp features make intimidation his dominant characteristic. Outnumbered and held at gunpoint, Indy, Short Round, and Sala stand with their hands up. Good to see you again, Duval. This your pappy? Jones is pistol whipped by Arcady. A splash of blood shoots from his lip. Show some respect, infidel! 
Indy spits red and raises his eyes. I guess that answers my question. He looks to the man leading the group. Raz al Ghul. And here I was beginning to think we'd never meet. Rish al Ghul, Doctor. It seems my reputation is more memorable than my name these days. Call yourself King Tut. Doesn't matter to me. Arcady takes an aggressive step forward to strike Jones again, but Raish puts a hand up to stop him. A half smile crosses his face. Your legendary wit knows no bounds, Doctor. Wish I could say the same for your skills as an archaeologist. Raish looks to the smoking hole in the ground. Indy follows his gaze, then looks back. Heard you were coming, so we threw a party. It was a blast. Amusing. Raish steps forward with an outstretched hand. The Ankh. Indy motions to the hole in the ground. Hope you like it hot. Unexpectedly, Raish surges forth and grabs Jones by the throat. His grip is like a vice. You have no idea what you're dealing with, mortal. This type of power is beyond your understanding. No being on this planet, living or dead, has searched for this tomb as long as I have. If you've taken it away from me, you'll lose more than your life. Suddenly, a bullet whizzes past Raish's head. More gunshots are heard as a few soldiers drop dead in front of our heroes. Arcady pulls his father back as Jones steps on his foot and clocks Duval to the ground before the good guys hit the deck. Among the gunfire, a small contingent of the League leads Raish away in their armored vehicle. Arcady is left there as Al Ghul doesn't break eye contact with Jones the whole way out of Dodge. The rescuers approach Indy, Short Round, and Sala and are revealed to be a group of British and Egyptian soldiers with Henry Jones Sr. and Basil Shaw in tow. Dad, I told you to stay put! It's an odd way to say thank you, isn't it, Basil? Indeed. They take a look at the smoking entrance to the tomb. Well, another lost cause. Indy smirks and pulls out the golden scarab key, hidden in his pocket. They all eye it with interest. I wouldn't say that. The bright gleam off the scarab whitens out the screen. We start to hear the relaxing sound of waves washing up over sand. The light gives way to the serene sight of a picturesque beach. We see a man sleeping back in a lounge chair with a brown fedora covering his face. A title reading 20 years later leisurely fades in and off the picture. Indiana Jones is awakened by the nudge of a woman next to him. We see his face again for the first time clean-shaven, gray hair, and showing all the miles of a man who's lived an incredible but stressful life. The woman next to him is shown to be Marion Ravenwood, or as she's currently known, Mrs. Marion Jones. Together, they gather their belongings and walk down the beach hand in hand. We cut to a gorgeous sunset. The sky has never looked so colorful, with purple, orange, and blue hues reflecting around the sinking star. Indy and Marion look happy together, content, but there's a disappointment in Jones's eye that he can't quite hide. Over the next few scenes, we see Marion and Indy's home, the places they frequent, and are clued in on their situation. Sometime in the late 1950s, Jones was stripped of his military rank of colonel after disobeying direct orders. He was caught returning artifacts that he had been tasked with recovering to their countries of origin, which caused a complicated mess for the U.S. government. He was recruited by the Office of Strategic Services during World War II and never liked military life anyway, but was surprised by his reprimand. With the Red Scare in full swing, he was officially accused of working for the Soviets. In lieu of jail time, he was given a choice to retire off U.S. shores. With his father recently passed away and a wife and son at that point, he made the difficult decision to uproot them and move to Morocco. Indy's son Henry had a rebellious streak in him that revealed itself more as time went on. He argued with his father many times over moving to the United States and enlisting to fight in Vietnam. When Henry was of age, there was little Indy could do to stop him, and he left to, in his mind, earn back the respect of their family name. That was two years ago. Jones's disappointing permanent vacation turns even more sour with the arrival of some U.S. military personnel who he's familiar with. The looks on their faces say everything he needs to know. Or so he thinks. We cut to Washington, D.C. and hone in on Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Indy and Marion enter a hospital room to see their son, Henry, lying unconscious. The doctor explains that he was involved in an attack that killed his entire unit. 
Against the odds, Henry seemed to improve enough to move back on U.S. soil, but things have taken a turn as they've been unable to wake him from his coma following severe head trauma. The prognosis isn't good, and the Joneses are told they may have made it just in time to say goodbye. Indy meets with the same military personnel who came to Morocco. It's a cold exchange as they quietly argue about the conditions in which Jones was forced out of the country and why his son was placed in such an active war zone. Jones and Marion stay the night at a local hotel. The sunset they peer at on the balcony feels much more bitter than before. That night at the hospital, a few doctors enter Henry's room and begin unhooking him from the medical equipment. A nurse enters and questions what's going on. As smoothly as possible, they assure her everything is fine before knocking her out with a simple touch. The imposters then continue their work as we see the mark of the League of Shadows on one of their exposed hands. The following day, Indy is notified that his son's been kidnapped. He's allowed to examine the body of the murdered nurse and sees a very particular indentation on her neck. After asking for more information about the scene, he deduces that the poison used to kill the nurse is something he's only seen one organization use, the League of Shadows. Jones demands to lead a team to find and rescue his son, but government officials nix the idea. Frustrated, Indy makes a few calls to some old friends, and after reluctantly allowing Marion along, they hop on a private plane in the dead of night. The airfield was accessed by an old military associate of his who believes Jones should have the chance to save his son. We see that the small airplane is piloted by none other than Short Round. Even though he's in his 30s, he still has some of that childlike energy that defined his initial appearance. The trio travel to Cairo and meet up with Salah. Together, they discuss their predicament and any rumors on the League of Shadows' survival. Arcady Duval is now in his 70s and is reportedly in very poor health, though his exact whereabouts remain a mystery after he was broken out of a prison a few months ago. The League is smaller than it used to be, but they still have a presence in the region. Sala knows an antique dealer who was once working for the organization. He escaped after paying dearly with his right eye. The next morning, the group pays this man named Aman a visit. He sports an eye patch and through a gruff voice tells them he knows where Arcady is being kept. However, he won't be taking them there. On cue, a few League of Shadows agents enter the room, led by a beautiful young woman with dark flowing hair. She gives the order and they attack. Our heroes fight off most of their assailants, but they're overwhelmed when the woman gets involved. The last thing Indy sees is a swift kick flying towards his face before darkness takes over. In the first person, we see eyes slowly opening. The face of Marion stares back at us. It's a memory of her as she was all those years ago on Indy's prime adventures. Jones enjoys the momentary respite from reality. Or has he finally bit the big one? As things become clearer, Jones is able to see he's in a comfortable room, laying on a bed. He moves his head to see a mirror in the corner and falls onto the ground, letting out a comedic yelp of shock. He shoots back up to his feet and sees that his reflection is that of his younger self. He looks to be in his early 40s at the oldest. Surprise gives way to a smile as he looks back at Marion. This isn't a memory after all. Indy and Marion are young again. Mrs. Jones begins to speak when the woman from the antique shop enters. She's pleased to see the couple are both awake and tells them to get dressed and follow her. In a high-tech war room for the late 1960s, the woman introduces herself as Talia Al Ghul, daughter of Raish, sister of Arcady Duval, and rightful heir to the League of Shadows. They're currently in Libya at her organization's hideout. There's somewhat of a civil war going on for control of the League, with Talia and her loyalists contending with the original outfit run by Duval and their father, Raish al Ghul. Indy and Marion have a lot of questions. Through monitors on display, visual examples, and enchanting charisma, Talia explains everything. Indy and Marion have had their youth restored by the regenerative powers of rare, naturally occurring phenomena called Lazarus Pits. They revitalize the aged and ensure longevity well past that of a normal human lifespan. Most of these pits have been discovered throughout the centuries and drained of their properties by Raish. When asked how old her father actually is, Talia responds that she's never gotten a straight answer. 
Her side of the organization has transformed full dips inside the pit into an injection process that eliminates the maddening side effects, but requires frequent boosters to keep the results. She just gave the last viable Lazarus pit liquid to Indy and Marion. When questioned why, she says it was a calculated risk. Indiana Jones is the only man who matched wits with her brother and stood toe to toe with Raish. He also knows the location of the last Lazarus pit, said to be the most powerful of them all. Indy brings up the tomb of Thoth Capera, and Talia confirms. The knowledge locked inside that tomb may contain unnatural secrets of life and death, and she can't allow her father to get his hands on it. Finally, she admits there's another incentive for him to help her. Raish has Henry and plans on using him to restore the aged and sickly Arcady, a son for a son. While she doesn't have all the details, it's enough for Indy and Marion to agree to help, as long as Sala and Short Round are released to lend a hand. Talia makes no qualms about their terms and outstretches her hand. Cautiously, Indiana Jones shakes it. The next chunk of the movie sees Indy leading the group while reconciling with his returned youth. His interactions with Sala and Short Round are very different. With Shorty, they look like contemporaries and form a new chemistry of cooperation. With Sala, things are slightly more dour. Every time he sees the older man, he's reminded of where age leads and entertains thoughts of staying young forever. Talking to Marion brings him back to reality. While most definitely helping in the pursuit of Henry, this goes against everything Indy believed in and resisted in his past experiences. She's a voice of reason that Jones appreciates now more than ever. Eventually, the group arrives at the location of Thoth Capera's tomb. It's obvious Raish and his men have been there for a bit as tents are set up, yet no one is around. What's left of the opening in the ground has been filled in with dirt and sand. It seems Indy has another idea how to get inside. In the decades since the prologue scene, Jones has studied the area even more extensively. It became a hobby after he was exiled to Morocco, studying one of the pieces of history that got away. The surrounding mountains hold the secret. Indy and Sala lead the way to a hidden temple of the god Thoth left abandoned after being rediscovered in the late 1800s. The team make their way underground through narrow tunnels that lead to a small village of sorts which house sacred shrines and tributes. At the end of the village is a doorway with the same markings seen in the prologue. It's a second entrance to the tomb. Indy then brings out the original golden scarab. He was able to acquire it through James Brody, the nephew of the late Marcus Brody, who mailed out the artifact upon Indy's urgent request before leaving DC. Their plan is to mold the other pieces through a weighted malleable material brought along by Talia. If that doesn't work, they might attempt to blast it open, a plan Indy has warned against. It's then that our villains arrive. Tailing them for quite a while, Ra's al Ghul's League of Shadows shows up with a large bald man called Ubu clearing the way. A brief showdown occurs with Jones and company coming up on the losing end. Indy attempts to punch Ubu in the fray and nearly breaks his hand. Ra's al Ghul reveals himself. He removes a decorative golden mask from his face and doesn't look a single day older than the last time Indy saw him. Behind him, carried on a palanquin and barely alive, is Henry. Indy and Marion's hearts sink. Ubu wheels in a severely old man with long white hair and a blank expression filling out a drooping, creased face. Raish tells Indy's group that this is his son, Arcady Duval. Duval's illness and lack of care at the prison he's been kept in all these years have made him into a virtual vegetable. While even the pit's powers cannot recoup his decayed form, there is a way passed down through the centuries which speaks of the ancient queen Thoth Capera using the control of her Lazarus pit to transfer the soul of one man to another. Henry is severely injured and on the brink of death, but nothing a quick dip can't fix. Indy was the only man who foiled one of Al Ghul's major plans, and he knows that same blood runs in Henry's veins. He'll be a worthy host for Raish's heir. A son for a son, he says. Raish isn't surprised that Talia used the last of the Lazarus Pit liquid to restore Indy and Marion to a more viable age. She's proved to be an infidel and usurper of his sovereign line. Arcady is his true successor and will be rejuvenated in a new body. Raish himself will become master over death through the sacred knowledge he searched for his entire centuries-long life. 
Indy mocks him for saying all this without the keys to even get inside. Shocked, Jones watches as Raish produces the same onk seen in the prologue, along with the Ibis key from the statue. Indy asks how this is possible when that entrance was blown to smithereens and covered in methane gas. Raish simply replies that his followers are very dedicated and will not hesitate to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Now with the missing scarab, he can finally achieve his true destiny and secure his successor for centuries to come, all while getting revenge against the one man who effectively stopped him from getting what he wants. Helpless, our heroes watch as Raish inserts the remaining pair of keys into the stone door. The small village begins to quake as the slab moves up. A large layer comes into view, with skeletons sprawled out every which way, surrounding a glowing green Lazarus pit. Talia motions to Marion. Near her feet is the detonator for the explosives they were going to try and open the door with. The explosives themselves sit near the entrance to the village, where a majority of Raish's men guard the exit. While Ubu is distracted by the sight of the lair, Marion picks up the detonator and presses it. An explosion erupts behind them. It takes down many of Raish's guards and distracts everyone long enough for Indy to follow Al Ghul into the lair, pick up a rusted sword from one of the skeletons, and cross blades with his enemy. Their shadows dance on the ceiling as Indy does his best to hold his own. In the middle of the melee, a figure rises out of the Lazarus pit. Queen Thoth Capera is a beautiful young woman who can somehow speak a language everyone in earshot can understand. She asks for the one who accessed her tomb and wishes to share all knowledge. Taking advantage of Indy's awestruck stare, Raish knocks him down the staircase and approaches the queen. He states his name and asks first for the knowledge of restoring his son in another's body. Thoth Capera requests that the subjects be brought to her, and Ubu steps forward, easily carrying both Henry and Arcady. They're both submerged in the pit as the queen's eyes glow green. Out of nowhere, Short Round swings in and knocks Raish over. He pulls Henry out of the pit and begins fighting Ubu. Jones gathers himself and sees what's happening. He rushes to retrieve his son, but gets mixed up in the battle with Ubu. Raish rises and watches his plan fall apart. Abandoning hope for his son, he exclaims that he wishes to gain true power over life and death, and begins to fall into a trance while staring at the queen. Thoth Capera motions for him to come near. He obliges as Talia screams from the doorway for her father to stop. Marion holds her back as Raish enters the pit and is kissed by the queen. She slowly transforms into a rotting, living corpse and is shown siphoning life from Al Ghul. He withers away before everyone's eyes as a green wave pulls him under. Scared stiff, every person there can't take their eyes off the scene. Following a moment of inaction, the queen screeches something inhuman. Slowly, all the skeletons in the tomb come to life. Indy, Short Round, Ubu, and the rest of the living fight for their survival. Jones yells for Marion to start closing the door as Talia fights off a few skeletons trying to escape. She can't bring herself to do it at first, but after another desperate prompt from her husband, she rips the staff off of one of the statue's hands and jams the keys out of the stone door. Damaged from the explosion and more, the whole place starts to break down. Rocks fall from the ceiling and splash into the Lazarus pit. Indy and Short Round work in sync. They know each other's next move before it happens. Together, they double punch Ubu into the pit and escape the grasp of the skeletons while carrying Henry out of the lair. The remaining henchmen have either fled or perished. As the door nears the ground, our group reconvenes to see they're missing one person, Sala. They look to see he's been brought under Thoth Capera's trance and is pacing toward the Lazarus pit. With no time left, Indy brings out his whip and lashes it to Sala's leg. The older man falls over, but Indy can't pull him back quick enough. The door is only a few feet from the ground. Shorty, Marion, and Talia grab the whip and help Indy tug back. Leaving one shoe behind, Sala barely makes it out before the stone door slams shut. There's not a moment to celebrate as the village and tunnels are collapsing. Screaming from behind the door can be heard as green light shines through the cracks. Everyone dashes away with the sound of wailing death just behind. We see our characters all pop out of the hidden temple entrance as it caves in. The last stone falls and deafening noise is replaced by an almost eerie silence. After a few seconds, they all laugh with relief. Well, another lost cause. 
I wouldn't say that, says Short Round. He holds up the scarab key and tosses it to his mentor. Fortune and glory, right, Dr. Jones? Indy laughs and points back. Just then, Henry snaps awake. He yells in confusion and blind aggression. Every muscle is tensed and his eyes are bloodshot. Talia mentions this is the side effect of raw submersion into a Lazarus pit. She attempts to land a blow to the head, but Henry throws her down with augmented strength. Indy tries to calm his boy down as everyone stands still, not sure what to do. Except Marion, that is. Jones protests as she walks toward her son with a visible determination. As he lunges forward, Marion connects with a right hand that rivals her husband's. Henry is stunned, but when he can finally focus, he sees Marion standing in front of him. Mom? The young man is perplexed on multiple levels. He sees his dad and questions his parents' youthful appearance before asking if he's dead. No, not yet. Emotionally, Indy hugs his son and wife before Sala and Short Round join in. Talia is seen looking down from a higher vantage point. A mix of triumph and contempt cross her face. Not yet, Doctor. Talia walks off with a few approaching League of Shadows members. We fade again to the setting sun back in Morocco. Indy and Marion are shown to be on the road back to their normal aged selves as Henry joins them, looking out at the peaceful twilight sky. The sun fully sets as we see the three of them in silhouette from behind. Indy's famous theme song blares as we cut to black. Indiana Jones and the Curse of the Lazarus Pit. What did you think? Like it? Hate it? What other characters would you like to see go head to head in future episodes? Let me know in the comments, and we'll see you on our next Fanscription Adventure.